The four R's is a, is a fundamental tool that we use throughout the book. And the idea is it's, it's um, doing what we call a conversational analysis, where you're going to think of a conversation. And, and, and again, the, the, we're trying to make it a very simple ex approachable exercise. So we recommend that people get a single piece of paper. And it doesn't even need to be a full sheet of paper. everybody. Welcome to the Control Freaks. I'm Bill. I'm Clarissa. And we're the Control Freaks. So today's got an awesome episode. But before I want to get to it, I want to pass it over to Clarissa. Because Clarissa, what should we be expecting or what should listeners be expecting for this episode today? Yep. In the sake of transparency, as the auditor in the room, I always love to make sure we be, are being overly overt with, with objectives. So super important to get that out uh, up front. So what we really want all of you to walk away with today is a better understanding of how to collaborate better, regardless of whether you're an auditor or an audit client. Jeffrey is going to help us with understanding how his book, Agile Conversations, can give us the tools that we all need, again, regardless of which side of the table you represent on how to collaborate more effectively to have better experiences in your work. That's perfect. So I'm going to give it just a little bit of an uh, overview of Jeff, and I want to pass it over to him to give us some background. So just quickly, Jeffrey Frederick, author of Agile Conversations, co-author of Agile Conversations, also co-host of the Troubleshooting Agile podcast and co-organizer of SITCON, C-I-T-C-O-N, which I'm going to get this correct, Jeff. It is the Continuous Integration Conference, correct? That's right. Continuous Integration and Testing. So it was DevOps before DevOps going back to 2006. That's why the website looked very OG. I loved yeah, that's it. Right. <laughs> it reminded me of the Space Jam days. Well, Jeffrey, tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. And I think the, um, the, the if we kind of go uh, forward in time rather than backwards, which is kind of the, um, I think people who, who um, would know me in the industry uh, before probably know me from my involvement in the world of continuous integration. Um, uh, I was one of the original um, uh, people on cruise control, or rather early into it. I started working with cruise control in 2001, which when the project was launched, but I was not one of the, my uh, co-organizer of KitCon was actually the, one of the founders of the project. I was an early adopter and then eventually became a developer on the project. And then we started the conference in 2006 um of, of KitCon to sort of to bring together other people in the world of continuous integration and to say ask the question of how far could we take this um well we've been you know still run the conference uh, we've had its 30 uh and the uh different appearances across four continents um and we're still learning new ways to to expand the, the reach of continuous integration and the, one way to look at it is that you know when continuous integration made it to uh, sysadmins, then it be suddenly became DevOps, uh, and when it makes it to uh, the auditors, you know, then it's uh, then it's your industrial DevOps, uh, you know, uh, getting your 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 uh, everything all all tied together. Um, so that's kind of the background, and then I uh, started studying communication uh, about um, of a different type in in 2011. Uh, before that, in the mid to, in 2000s, I had uh, worked at different tool companies. And I'd been kind of all over the business product divide. So both as an engineer, running engineering teams, also in product and product management, um, and spent a lot of time as an um, evangelist, kind of evangelizing test-driven development, uh, agile principles, continuous integration. And uh, so I studied, did a lot of public speaking. But then starting in 2011, I started studying uh, individual communication and really uh, studying the question of like why teams fail to thrive, what what prevents time, uh, teams from being very uh, effective in the way they could be and, and the connection between that and the conversations you have on teams. That's what led to then later the Troubleshooting Agile podcast uh, with my uh, uh, co-host Douglas Squirrel and uh, then the book Agile Conversations where Squirrel is also the co-author. So you are, I, I, I love when I get to meet folks like you because there is a, when I say a handful, it's a little more than five, but like there's some foundational folks because like KitCon, and I pronounced it wrong, I said SitCon, but KitCon 
it was its first one looks like it was in Chicago in 2006. Am I correct on that? Yeah, that's right. And DevOps wasn't a term until 2009. And the 2009. Agile made a f- and, in two- yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Patrick Dubois actually attended KitCon in 2008, uh, met some other people there who he then invited to the first DevOps days in 2009. And, uh, and I've been talking to Patrick on and off over the years. And so there definitely was a connection between those people uh, involved in CI early and, and the early days of DevOps. Some of the same people were attending both conferences. This is phenomenal. Like- lost words or something like this because i think a lot of people forget they see devops today they're thinking tools they think all of this really techie stuff but like in in your book you really get down to the heart of of devops and agile and really uh people first and we'll get to that we'll get to that here in a bit but like i just i what i what i wanted to call that i was looking through i was like it, it, og people like people sometimes and this is this is me like i like to understand the history of things but i think more people should understand the history of where it came from and continuous integration like that word's been around the concept has been around a lot longer and there's more to it than just getting Jenkins or a CI tool. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so, I mean, if I were going back and sort of like, I actually started, um, was involved in the community that is now called Agile in 2009, which is before the term Agile, which it was before the Snowbird people got together and, and, and coined the term Agile, and they were trying to decide what to call it. So I was reading the C2 wiki, which is the first wiki in the world, you know, uh, 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 created by Ward Cunningham. And there is a discussion space on there for extreme programming. Um, so I was reading that in 1999 uh, and trying to experiment with this stuff about unit testing before JUnit was written. Uh, so I've, I've seen a lot of changes over, over time. One of the That's things awesome. that I think is really awesome uh, about what we're going to talk about today and Jeffrey, everything that you bring to the table is when we a lot of times when we think about agile and devops we think technology world and the software development and that it's only applicable there um and then so part of what my platform is is bringing that outside of just the technology world and just software development and into a world like internal audit um and so what you talk about in agile conversations is some of that a lot of that foundational piece of conversations and collaboration that is not just, I mean, it's certainly applicable to software development and technology, but it helps us, I think, open our minds to this is broader than just one line of business or one type of industry. So, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, well, just another conversation about agile or another conversation about software development. This is not just that. This is much broader than that. So I think I think our listeners are really in for a treat today. Yeah, this is really about how humans collaborate. So Mm -hmm. that's really, and if you have humans and they need to work together, then this will be relevant. (laughs) Well, well, so that narrows it down. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The best part about teams are the people, and the worst part about teams are people. I think I've seen that somewhere before. Well, like, so Jeff, what led you to write Agile Conversations? Um, Well, I think the, for me, it was really the experiences I've had uh, adopting um these techniques and and really the surprise that it 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 that I had in learning them um you know I started in software in 1992 so I'm you know a, a little bit older than probably a lot of the listeners uh older than median and I've always been really interested in understanding what helps teams to be highly productive what are the practices how do you how do how do we make things better um and it, I also found a, cor- a correlation here of like how to reduce suffering in software development. You know, how to, how to, it always felt like there was a lot of unnecessary pain and how could we, you know, both be more effective and re- re- remove unnecessary pain. And <clears throat> I think what happens, I was actually a bit proud uh, and I felt like I was really good at this. And then I was in a conversation at KitCon and I had someone say something to me that I didn't understand at first. We were having a discussion. He said, Jeff, I noticed you're really good at advocacy, but I don't hear much inquiry. And I was baffled because this is very clearly jargon, right? This is someone who was using word, these words that I knew, but in a, in a technical sense that I didn't understand. And it was this uh, person named Benjamin Mitchell. 
And he had been studying the work of a business uh, professor from Harvard called uh, Chris Argerus, who wrote stuff going back into the 70s uh, about the what causes organizational dysfunction and how to get around it. And he'd had this conversational focus. And it opened up this world to me that I had never come across uh, of, of really systematizing the kind of interactions people have and, and introducing a bunch of jargon I'd never heard before. And, and I would say the one of the heart of it was this gap between espoused theory, the things that we say we believe, that we say are the right things, and theory in use, what we actually do. And that there's this disconnect between what we believe is the right way to act and the way we actually act. <laughs> And the techniques of how you uncover that. And it turns out that if you have a good espoused theory and you don't follow it, then you get bad results. And um, when when people have espoused theory and they're doing something different, um, you know that you end up with all kinds of problems. And that, that that ends up being a root a root cause problem. And so this is I just joined a company in London. I, I was in London for ten years from uh, 2011 and uh, eventually became CTO there and was able to start applying some of the lessons, the conversational lessons among the development team there and um, really had fantastic results. Um, uh, some of this has been written up in another book from IT Revolution called A Radical Enterprise. Um, some of the people who were there and really moved towards eventually self-organization and self-management. But the even if you don't take it that far, but just the, the camaraderie and the effectiveness that happened when we applied these principles that are things that everyone would agree are the right right thing to do. And I, I think that was the, the heart of it that really appealed to me. Um, if, we, if I ask any group of people, I've done this from stage many times, I'll call on people in an audience and say like, okay, the three of us here, you know, are, need to come up with a, a decision of some kind. Maybe it's like where we're gonna meet uh, in person, like how would we decide it? I'm not actually going to put you on the spot here because I I'll know what you say. Everyone would say, well, we should get suggestions from everyone. Okay, I'm like okay, so you you'll be curious then what people have to say. Oh yes, are you going to share your own thoughts on where we should meet? Yes, I would. Okay, so it'd be transparent. Curiosity, transparency. Everyone agrees that's the best way to make decisions, and everyone agrees, and everyone actually does that unless they feel there's something important at stake. As soon as it's something that people think is important, they behave differently. People, people stop being curious because why should I be curious? I'm right. I already have the right answer. And, and the, if, I, if, you, if we don't do the right thing, well, that would be bad. So I should really try to optimize for, and this is the, what happens in people's minds, they start optimizing for how do they get their way rather than being open and transparent and, and curious. And so that's where, where things go awry. So it's a kind of a very simple model, um, but it ends up having a lot of explanatory power for the problems that we see in, in practice. Holy cow, I just had a flashback of a lot of decisions I've made as you said that. You've explained <laughs> to me something I haven't been able to like, I, I've noticed myself doing this. Really, you're talking about curiosity, transparency. When I really, I won't say I don't have anything at stake, but when I don't, I guess when I say I don't have anything personal at stake on it, then I'm like, yeah, you get in these good conversations and the outcomes are great. But then all of a sudden when there is a perception, when I'm biased towards maybe if something goes wrong, like whatever that bias may be, all of a sudden it's less of a transparent and curious conversation and more of either a negotiation or a sell. Yeah. Um, wow. Holy cow. <laughs> So, I just, uh, so the answer was, why did we write the book? Because having had the experience of how powerful it could be with teams um, and how this was that this was a skill. I think this is a really key thing that like having these productive conversations was a skill that was learnable. And so the, the hope it would put out there and inspire other people to try to learn these skills and then get these results that we were able to get. Jeffrey, I want to I want to go back to something that you said during that. You said um, one of your goals was to reduce suffering and unnecessary pain yeah. in the software development process. And when I think about when people talk about auditing, um, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people's goals, if they had, you know, I, I'd like to ask if you had a magic wand, how would you make it better? <clears throat> what would you, how would you use that to make the audit process better? Uh, I think a lot of people would say 
less suffering and less unnecessary <laughs> pain for the audit process. So can you share some of um, some advice or some of the things that you've that have been successful in reducing the suffering and unnecessary pain in the software development process that might be applicable beyond just that? Um, well, I would say there's there's if, if I go back to what the um, unnecessary pain in software development, there's kind of was two elements to it um, that are I think are relevant to audit. One in particular was about establishing shared facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> pretty foundational, and and actually that was one of the if it, in my for my background with the continuous integration, that was one of the was one of the benefits was that the the continuous integration uh, when we CI servers were new would be like is the build passing or failing right it, it's like a it's like a very foundational question that you kind of now develop a source of truth so mm -hmm. one thing is about what are your oracles how do you develop source of truth how do you capture that and so people are talking the same things but first of the first thing is just having shared shared facts uh, which can often be a collaborative process to get there and then after that is well what do they mean you know mm -hmm. what's the what's the meaning of the facts and that's where i think the conversational elements uh, come in how do we how do we make sense of the facts now that we have them and how do we have a shared interpretation or shared theories um and you know also getting into next steps you know what what do we agree the next steps are going to be which is a question of joint design uh that is getting people on the on the same page of how are you going to move forward so you you brought up uh, a couple a couple of really uh real tensions yeah. and challenges with auditing um and we talked a little bit in the pre-recording session about, you know, what are some of those tensions and conflicts between the auditors and clients? And you touched on a couple of them. Um, a lack of value from the audits. So I think that, you know, what's the meaning of the facts is yeah. the auditors come with, here's here's what we found. But that meaning of what does that mean and what's the value isn't always clear yeah. uh, to everyone involved. And then... Um, kind of seemingly endless negotiations over those. So are, are we even aligned on those shared facts? Or are they what's clear to one person or one side of the, of the table versus the other? So That's I think right. about a lot of what you're hitting on here is incredibly relevant to anybody who has ever been or will be involved in an audit going forward. Yeah, great. It's, you early on in the book and i love you talking about like just like fundamental basis i'll just use the word first principles so getting down like you talk about like use, using a word like i just for the tech people are unit test how many times do people misuse unit test and meant different things like that's a that's a very <laughs> very easy one uh, yeah. but you getting down to the fundamentals you talk about agile and devops and, and some history and i don't go too deep in history but you talk about management philosophies and i i find mm. this very critical and key because when a lot of people talk about agile or devops it's scrum this it's ci it's cd it's tools it's tech but and for the leaders listening to this and the managers you talk about the concept of taylorism and sort of our modern well with the let's just say that the, the theory of management we're working our way out of as we get into more uh, more agile practices um mm. for our listeners today I, I love how you use the word software factory which is funny long story short i built a service for red hat called the software factory which is <laughs> i looked at how you're describing in a couple of things i'm like in my back of my mind i'm like you know what while we didn't mean to do what you talk about we were actually we were we were pushing that level of management but taylorism if you talk about taylorism mm -hmm. could you just briefly discuss what it is how to spot it and why this philosophy of management needs to change sure i will and, and i and i want to talk about taylorism from two sides because among uh, um, people who think about culture in uh, in companies <clears throat> taylorism is often just dismissed as an obviously bad idea and, and but Taylorism also had a big positive effect. And I want to so I want to talk about both. So Taylorism, Taylor, uh, uh, Frederick Taylor was the first management consultant in, uh, in the world. And so back at the start of um, mass manufacturing, um, uh, Taylor as a person did a lot of uh, time and motion studies and he had a lot of he was an efficiency expert that would help people uh, retool their factories to massively uh, improve the productivity. So it was really, it was a change in time of um, manufacturing from craft, 
uh, manufacturing to really industrial modern manufacturing. And, <clears throat> and so there's this uh, element of terrorism that's been hugely successful uh, you know the, the the wealth of the modern world is is rooted in the success of Taylor um, looking at uh, the the facts, the time and motion, like what can people actually do, uh, as opposed to having and then what are establishing norms and practices and having everyone follow the best practices um, had really positive impacts. However, at the same time, his approach um, could also end up. Uh, result in, in, a, in a dehumanization of the work that was being done because there is an element to which um, it was optimized in some extent for low skilled uh, labor to come in and, and, and uh, do repetitive jobs in exactly the same way. And the, the idea is that the managers were the people who knew what should be done and the workers were essentially robots. Um, they, they were just being directed to um, fulfill the same task again and again, and creativity was not desired um, because the whole point was you were supposed to do what you were told. The, ma the machine of the factory depended on the individuals as cogs, and that that mindset uh, is one of the, the negative effects of Taylorism that became when people say Taylorism, they often mean this idea of humans as cogs uh, in a, in the machine of the company of the factory. And so that, and you know, the, the, the part of the reason that, that spreads is because that's a kind of uh, positive uh, uh, idea for managers, right? Because if there's a machine where everyone else is cogs and I'm in charge, all the good things that happen from the factory are because of me. And all the bad things that happen are because of these defective cogs running around. If only they would do their job and follow my you know, uh, direction, we would never have any problems. That's a very attractive way for, for people to think. Uh, and so I think that's part of the reason that this sort of negative uh, idea of Taylorism spread uh, so predominantly. I like how you, I, I, I like how you gave the good and bad of it because you're right. When I've heard this before, I was like negative this, negative that, and here's this new thing. Um, Clarissa in the auditing world, how Jeff talked about Taylorism. How do you see like because you wrote like I mean the whole purpose of beyond agile auditing is to go from here's the, the face thing to go from uh, to go from you know this traditional like I'd almost say this Tayloristic approach. While you didn't use those words, to this more human centered approach. Um, yeah, I feel like there, I, I mean, this this was insightful to me. But like, what do you, what do you think about how Jeff's talking about this, and how do you see it in the auditing world? Yeah, totally, totally relatable. So like, Jeffrey, as you're talking, uh, I think Bill, you were doing it earlier, just like, oh my gosh, like all these like aha moments and everything. Uh, I'm going through some of the same things here. Um, you know, you talked about kind of the negative of Taylorism of dehumanizing things. Um, I think about that is when it comes to the way we've been auditing for a very long time, um, I think we've unfortunately dehumanized the auditors in the audit process of we're here to execute this, we're going to execute our plan, and we're going to follow these steps and do these things. Um, and that also kind of happened with when, so a little bit of context, in the internal auditing world, we typically use a waterfall approach for audits. Um, we started to move, we knew we needed to change what we were doing. So we moved to sprint based agile auditing, which is basically scrum applied to the audit process. And in a lot of instances it failed because we were focused on scrum means we have to do standups. So let's do standups and scrum means we have to do sprints. So let's do sprints without understanding. And Bill and I talked about this, um, at does this year. And that was an aha moment for me of a lot of it's successful, mostly successful when you understand why you're doing those things and what the foundational pieces of why sprints are a good idea in which situations and what what how why you're doing standups and how to do standups rather than just doing them. Um, so I think because we got so focused on our waterfall process and that's just how we did things, we kind of dehumanized it. And then we kind of transferred that when we went to agile auditing and a lot of organizations ha had trouble with that and, and some failed with implementing that. Uh, so I see that as kind of the negative side of it. But then from the positive side, if I think about uh, and some of the things you said earlier of establishing those shared facts, I mean, we we can sometimes do that just through data, but understanding the data, we need that collaboration with each other. We can't just 
maybe in some organizations you can, but typically they're complex organizations. The data is complex. So even if you were making those database decisions, like data driven decisions, there still needs to be that shared understanding of what type of data do we need to look for? What what would constitute this is a good result or this is a, a, an ineffective result? So there's definitely a lot of ties in Jeffrey, what you were saying with the today's internal audit process, and I think where we need to go of bringing the human side back into it, bringing that collaboration, um, and and I think that's where we're going to find success going forward. Now, let me let me ask you this, Carissa, because in the book, Jeff really talks about conversations being a tool to overcome biases. Did I get that right, Jeff? Yeah, I think that's that's a, that's a good way to to put it. I'd say more, more than that, the kind of conversational skills we talked about here are ways to discover uh, bias, so you can then have better conversations with other people. And Clarissa, would you say some of the traditional auditing processes are biased or highly biased? Would that be a good qualification? I think there are biases from. There's the potential for biases for everyone involved in the audit, being the auditors or the clients. Uh, and I say that and everyone in the audit world is probably going to throw their shoe at me or something because we are supposed to be uh, objective. That is part of the definition of internal audit. There are a lot of standards around how we are supposed to maintain our objectivity. Uh, yet we are human and we have developed biases throughout um, throughout our lives. So I think. Jeffrey, to your point of having the tools to be able to recognize those biases and then overcome them to have an effective conversation is absolutely necessary, um, especially as an auditor, for us to maintain that objectivity. Well, I think so especially I, in the environment where you're talking about here, the, the fundamental, I'll get, name one of these biases, and I think the one that's the most pervasive and kind of the root of a lot of other ones is um, uh, something called naive realism. Naive realism is the idea that I see the world as it is, that's it. But, you know, the world is the way that I see it. And there's implications of that. One is that you see the same world that I do. And therefore, uh, the because I see the world accurately, the implications I draw are correct, which means you should draw the same implications. And if you don't, then either you're, you're being malicious, like you do see that, that my implications are correct, but you're choosing to, to disagree with them, or you're incompetent. Right? And that's, this is what naive realism leads us to. And that's when you say that everyone has biases because it's just so, it's, it's natural to think that what we see is what's there. And, and, and that's that's just not the way the world actually is. And even two people looking at the same thing can draw completely different conclusions. Um, that happens a lot. <laughs> of course. And, and so I'm glad you said that too, because I think about it from the other side. So I, I well, I spent most of my career as an auditor. I have been on the other side. I have been audited. Uh, and I think about even when we're going in and so let's say you're getting audited and you are accountable for this particular product or process, you see it as the way that you think it should be working. You might not see it as it's actually working though. And that's a lot of times what we'll see is we'll have a conversation and say, so how is this, how does this work? And mm -hmm. our clients will describe to us, here's how it works. It's really how they think it should work or how yeah. they think it's working. And then we go in and do testing and we provide actually, this is how it's working, not the way you described it. And to your point, that's where I think we get into a lot of those negotiations and we need to align on those shared facts because what you just said was, I'm coming to you with this is something different. I'm not seeing it the same way you are. Therefore, I must be wrong. And as the yeah. auditor, I'm seeing it this way. It's not the way that you see it. Therefore, you must be wrong. And for yeah. everybody must be wrong. <laughs> it just does not <laughs> lead to, um, you know, especially when you walk into it thinking you're wrong, no, you're wrong. That leads to defensiveness and shutting down and just not effective conversations. Yeah, that's right. So, it's so speaking, go ahead. It's interesting you, you get there and we may be going to the same point. So um, you always espouse these coffee conversations. And one of our previous guests, Robert Kelly, specifically asked, like, how do I have these conversations? Now, Jeff, you have a concept and it's to give people who are going to read the book page 32. You have it's called <laughs> the four R's. 
And I feel like, of course, you're going like as we're going through the audit, there is there is incumbency upon an individual to sort of think about how they think and think about how they're going to converse. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to spill uh, spill the beans in the four R's, but like the four R's, could you explain what that is and sort of um, how maybe this helps in these situations? Sure. And it, the the four R's is, is a is a fundamental tool that we use throughout the book. And the idea is it's, it's um, doing what we call a conversational analysis, where you're going to think of a conversation. And, and, and again, the, these are trying to make it a very simple, ex- approachable exercise. So we recommend that people get a single piece of paper. And it doesn't even need to be a full sheet of paper. You know, I, I, you know, you have some, if I was in Europe, would use an A5 notebook for this. Um, you know, fold that piece of paper in half, make two columns. And then you're going to re- do the four R's are record. You're going to record the conversation in, in two parts. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Having written it down, you're going to reflect on the conversation. You're going to study it. You're going to make marks on the page that you can then get some insight into what was happening. And then from that insight, you'll revise. You'll try writing out a new conversation. How could I have approached this more skillfully? Or, you know, maybe I'll try five different alternatives and see which one I like. We had a chance to explore alternatives. And then ideally, I have an opportunity to role play, uh, which is to actually act it out. Uh, that that's can be useful because I often see the case that people like what they've written. And then when they try to say it out loud, they go, wait, I don't talk like that. No mm-hmm. one talks like that. <laughs> so a chance to speak out loud. Of course, there's two other things here, which is there's the um, you might repeat this process. Uh, uh, and then also you can have role reversal where ideally you have um, someone else who can try speaking your lines back to you. Now, there are six four R's, but, you know, it's a book on conversations, not maths. So that's that's fine. <laughs> but Just two it, bonus you, R's. That's right. Two, two bonus R's. You only R's. pay for four, but you get six. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> exactly. It's like 50 percent extra. There you go. Um, so the, the process here, if I want to focus a little bit more on that record step, because I think this is really the. Uh, key element um, is when you, I said we, we'll, we'll get two columns on the page, and yes, you can do this electronically. So you know, people who, who, who don't deal with paper, yes, you can do it electronically. And what you can do though, in the right-hand column, you'll start by writing down the conversation as you recalled it in a, sort of a screenplay format. I said this, they said that, you know, the third person said this. And I'm saying conversation here, and this could be Slack messages, this could be instant messages, what, are, what you know, it could be any of those. <clears throat> so you're right, you'll capture the screenplay element. And you can think about it, anything that's visible, what would show up on a video camera, is, a tape recording, is what shows up on the right-hand column. It's the facts, as best you can recall. And then the left-hand column, and, and, and by the way, I'll say this, we're talking about this sometimes about conversations that haven't happened yet. So... If it's also going to be if there's a conversation you're dreading, you're going to prepare for, how do you think it might go? How are you afraid it might go? Write down specifically the transcript of how that might go on the right. Then the left-hand side, the left-hand column is what are the thoughts and feelings that you have corresponding to that line of dialogue? So, you know, Bill says this, what am I thinking? I say this, what am I thinking and feeling and what I'm talking? <clears throat> so the, the right is what's visible and shared. And the left is what's internal. And that's it. We want to start by capturing both of those. And then we get into the reflect step. And there's different tools to reflect. But often comes down to what's the difference between the visible and invisible. And is there evidence? You could look at this kind of as an, as an audit. I'm going to audit myself to say, like, am I, I think I'm being transparent. Well, let's check. Let's underline everything in the left-hand column that doesn't show up on the right. So in other words, if I thought something or I felt something, but I didn't share it, then underline it. And now suddenly I have a mark of all the things that I didn't share. Gosh, I guess I wasn't as transparent as I thought. Was I curious? Well, look on the right-hand side. Underline or circle, rather, all of the question marks in my sentences. Did I ask any questions? No? Then I probably wasn't very curious. But even if I asked a question, then there's another test. And this is why we call this the question fraction. Um, how many of those questions were genuine? Mm-hmm. Right? And what I mean here is did I have genuine curiosity? 
And the test for this is, could the answer have changed my mind? Because if I'm asking a question where the answer wouldn't change my mind, it's not actually evidence of curiosity. And that might seem strange because often people will think, but well, look, I asked a question and yeah, I wanted the answer, but would it really change your mind? Often questions are used to make a point. They're used rhetorically. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a softer way of making a statement, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a, and in particular, sometimes they're used as a way of gathering evidence to try to force people to see things from our point of view. Like we're, we're not using questions to, 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 as curious, curiosity, we're trying to convince and guide and control the conversation through our questions. So in those cases, you don't get credit. <laughs> and then you come with your question fraction and I can say, oh, I asked three questions and none of them were genuine. That's not a lot of evidence of curiosity on my part. And that's kind of, I can get an aha moment from that. Like, oh, I'm not being as curious or transparent as I thought. Let's revise. Let's try to do better. So if I'm going to head into that coffee conversation tomorrow, uh, how do I hope it's going to go? Am I going to be curious and transparent? I'm, if, you know, I've helped prepare myself. What would that look like? I'm much more likely to execute with these skills if I've done the planning in advance. I'm less likely to get um, caught, surprised, and suddenly end up in a defensive mindset or a negative mindset that leads the conversation in a, in a bad direction. That's awesome. So to recap, so for the listeners, because this is something that they can do today, they can reflect on something, a conversation that they had, or to your point, which I love this too, is preparing for a future conversation, especially maybe this is their first coffee chat uh, that they're setting up with a client. Or if you're an audit client, maybe this is your first coffee chat that you're setting up with an auditor. You know, how do you think it's going to go? So record, reflect, revise, role play, and then the two bonuses, repeat (laughs) and role reversal. That's right. Repeat until you feel comfortable. That's, you know, you can, you can do this as many times as you like. See, the one thing I like about that, the aspect you bring on genuine on the question. I think that's very critical key. And uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, Jeff, to do this with you at the DevOps Enterprise Forum as you led the, the, the forum there. And I realized as I was going through it, I think it was replaying a, a conversation I had like a week or two before. It was a tough conversation. And I realized at that point in time, like, hold on a second. I wasn't genuine and I wasn't transparent. I wasn't curious. I did exactly what you're doing. I was asking the questions out and we're asking the questions. I was basically leading the horse to water. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a, I mean, like, I think I knew I knew I was doing that, but I didn't really know, no, I was doing that. <laughs> yeah. You can have that kind of like real realization, like, oh my God, <laughs> this is not what I thought was happening. And this is a trap that a lot of um, a lot of times junior auditors will will come into will fall into is I have the questions or they come with a list of questions that they want to ask and mm. they're so focused on I need to get through these questions and a walkthrough um, because typically auditors aren't experts in all the areas that we audit we know enough to be able to ask the right questions and be curious but that curiosity is really a core uh, fundamental attribute of a of a good auditor. Um, but sometimes we either get intimidated from not knowing. I mean, we're sitting here with the expert of this, of whatever it is that we're auditing. So we prepare by asking, here's our list of questions. And then we go down the list and ask the questions. And a lot of times it's, we're listening to the answers, but it's just to get down and answer the question. And we're not thinking, we're thinking about the next question, not thinking about what did they just say? And yes. hold on, now I have another question that's not on my list, but I want to I want to pull this thread a little bit more. So that's that's something that and you know, a lot of times we'll see with more junior auditors. Uh, mm-hmm. But that reminder of are they? I love how you use the question quotient. Is that yeah, what? The, the, the question fraction. Yeah. yeah. Question fraction. I love yeah. that. Um, of are these genuine questions and do they represent curiosity? And the check for that being if would the answer would it answer change my mind? So that is incredibly yeah. helpful. Um, regardless of what profession you're in, but I definitely see a, an alignment alignment there, which kind of makes me, brings me to um, a quote from, from your book, uh, Agile Conversations, that is kind of related to that. The quote, and I'm going to read it here, is, uh, truly understanding how the business works is the most valuable learning, more productive and appealing than employee development trainings. It's the rocket fuel of high performance and lifelong learning. 
So I recently surveyed my LinkedIn network about asking our audit client, my audit clients in the network, what their biggest challenge is when they get audited. And hands down, the majority of respondents said that lack of auditor knowledge about how the business works is one of their greatest challenges. So as an audit client, something that is a huge challenge for them is the auditors don't understand my business. Mm -hmm. So can you, and I know we're getting close to the end of our episode, but um, can you help us with how someone might leverage the concepts that you talk about in Agile Conversations to help overcome that challenge, be it as an auditor or an audit client? Sure, absolutely. And, I, and I, I'm going to go ahead and, and draw on a tool that's in uh, the third chapter. Um, we, and I, so, I mean, um, Bill, uh, uh, I know you like the idea of um, TDD for people, right? Test driven development for people. And it's using a tool um, that uh, goes back to I mentioned before Chris Argerus and, and, and maybe popularized by one of his students, uh, Peter Senge, in the book, The Fifth Discipline. And that's something called the ladder of inference. And the ladder of inference is a simple mental model saying that we start with kind of observations of the world, you know, data, and then we, we, we mentally create meanings and assumptions and eventually conclusions and beliefs about the world and we take actions up at the top of our ladder. And I think the it, we're describing when you're, you're dealing with people, it's really important to, in the TDD idea is you build a shared understanding from the bottom up. So you start with describing what are shared facts, what's the data, and then you talk about the meaning next. So rather than jumping to conclusions or actions, which I think is a natural thing, you know, hey, we found this, therefore you should do this, mm -hmm. right? Now let's go in between and fill in the gaps. You know, we look at this evidence, this data, well, we think it, this is what it means. Is that right? Do you see it the same way? Okay, that's the test. That's the test-driven development part, right? Um, you know, is there any other relevant data you see? Okay, let's test, you know? Okay, what's the meaning of that? Great. Now, what are, what are, what are the assumptions we're making to explain this? Cool, what conclusions can we draw then? Here's what we draw, what do you draw? So it's this, it's this back and forth of, uh, um, you know, advocacy and inquiry, of sh transparency and curiosity you know, sharing and then asking and, and testing. And the idea is it's like when you're doing test driven development, you don't move up the ladder until you have a green, until you have agreement, right? And when you find a disagreement, then you're like, oh, well, this is an area to explore more. Let's go understand. And then you're building the understanding together in the area that matters, right? Uh, where, where, because, you know, there'll be some places where there's disagreements that don't matter. There'll be, you know, misunderstandings, you know, that you don't, you don't need your auditor become an expert in your business. You need them to know what's relevant to what's in a discussion. Um, and this is a way of guiding to that that shared understanding of what's what's relevant, what's the meaning, do we have a shared interpretation? Or if, if we don't, and this is one thing we talk about in the book, there's no law of physics that says that two people will necessarily come to the same conclusions from the same data. That's not the case. But what you can do is know where your differences lie. You should be able to articulate, you know, what the differences are. That's success, right? If you discover that and you can you can articulate what the differences are and where they arise, then that's 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 all you can guarantee uh, from any conversation from two people of of you know who are well intentioned. They should be able to get to that point no matter what. Um, not that you'll always get there in every conversation, but that's the goal. Yeah. Um, and the good news is a lot of times you will end up agreeing once you work this out. And that's that's often you get kind of the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You know, you end up with a third in a third place that neither of you rec realized coming in. And that's that's why we have teams. That the reason we have teams is different people see different things, bring different elements together. They have the conversation and they come up with something that, you know, no one expected. That's the advantage of having a diversified team that brings those different perspectives and different thoughts and even different biases to the table. A hundred percent. Exactly. It's like you're, you're not going to, you're not going to have an unbiased person because mm -hmm. that is not possible. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is that is share your thinking openly. So it's testable for other people. And that's how you learn about, Oh, wait a minute. I, I don't see it that way. Why do you, what's your experience that led you to, to see it that way? Oh, I, you know, I see it differently. Here's my experiences. And then between the, the set of you, you can kind of hopefully triangulate on, on something closer to the truth. This is phenomenal. I, I, I love that. The, the latter of inference and how you explained it is. Um, so, Jeff, as, as, as we close this out, uh, 
we have some great stuff here. The four R's, letter events, we're going to talk about Taylorism, and, and, and especially Carissa around your conversations, coffee conversations. So now we have an answer for the audience of like, what, what should you have in those conversations? They should at least start with the four R's uh, aspect. <laughs> so I, as, as, as we close the episode out, uh, Jeff, if there's one thing besides buy the book and read it, Agile <laughs> Conversations, uh, if there's one thing that our listeners could take away with that you think is probably a very important aspect or place to start, um, what would you leave them with? Um, I would say is really that this takes practice. Um, it, it's This is not a question of knowledge. If you look back at what I said earlier, is everyone already agrees that and transparency and curiosity is the right way to be. So it's not a it's not a knowledge gap. This is really a skills gap, and so expect to have to practice. Uh, Chris Argus, who I've quoted a, a couple of times, he said it takes about as long to get good at this as it does to have a, a not very good game of tennis, right? If you went out if you went out to play tennis, you wouldn't expect to be that good the first time out. <clears throat> first time you do the four R's and you investigate your conversation, you, you should expect to be disappointed <laughs> with what you find. You shouldn't. But the, the, the challenge is when you make a mistake playing tennis, it's obvious to you, you know, the ball goes out of the court, it hits the net, you know, you maybe you miss entirely and you know, you get feedback. I think the, one of the, the, the challenges for people in developing their conversational skills is that their mistakes are often invisible to them. Yeah. And uh, so people might be listening to this and think, yeah, this is really good advice for other people. I know some other people who could really benefit from this. <laughs> um, and, and it's but for we, those people. We are the other people. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> it, this, is, this is something where, uh, in fact, the, the very most valuable insight that I had in doing the practice is once I kind of had a sense of the theory and could identify some of the errors was... Um, it, it is I could first start spotting them in other people. And so I developed what's called the mirroring principle, which if I saw someone else making this mistake, oh, they're not being very curious. They're not asking genuine questions. They're not being transparent. They're not sharing their thoughts and feelings. They're, they're just talking about conclusions. They're not sharing their data or how they got there. When I couldn't label those, I would then uh, just automatically assume I was making the exact same mistake at the exact same time. And all it was is the it was easier to spot any other people. And I found like huh. this is true like ninety eight percent of the time. <laughs> it was like, oh, they're not asking questions. Oh, I should ask a question. <laughs> oh, they're not being transparent. I should be more transparent. They're not sharing their reasoning. Let me share my reasoning. But that was the single most powerful <laughs> change to my practice. Um, was was once I could spot these things is, is to is is to realize that. Well, this wasn't a mistake that other people made alone. I made them. I just couldn't see them. And so that's, uh, that, that's I think, that hopefully give people some motivation to practice. And the four R's give them the, 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 the tools to practice with. So even the person who wrote the book about it recognizes <laughs> that there's still value in everyone. Everyone can benefit uh, from this. It's not just uh, for other people. Absolutely. I do a monthly meetup. Uh, uh, after conversations meetup, we do a conversational dojo every month. My my desk is littered with the the papers uh, marked up uh, from doing the four hours every month. And the, you know one of the meetups was today. So this is something that I practice uh, you know uh, at least once a month and have for uh, years. I mean probably coming on a decade now that I've been running that meetup. Well, Jeffrey, is... I, I know I'm going to take this back as a takeaway for myself. I've got some conversations coming up that I want to prepare for, and I'm going to use the four plus two uh, R's. And um, I hope our listeners can uh, start implementing this right away and, and shining some light on some improvement opportunities, regardless, again, what part of the organization they represent. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Great. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Um, Clarissa, this is been phenomenal. I love the takeaways. And um, yeah, well, I'm Bill. I'm Clarissa. Remember, and this is the be a freak, freaks. not a foe. Not a foe. <laughs> <laughs>